Third John, we're in verse 11. Chapter two. Yeah, chapter 2. <laughs> Third John, verse 11. Beloved, follow not that which is evil. Uh, no, let's go back. I'm in the wrong verse. Okay. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. Well, duh. Yeah. <laughs> You'd think some of these things are so simple and basic. Why would you have to tell somebody that? You have to. We have to be reminded of that ourselves. Okay. Follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Okay, that's a repeat of what he's already said in 1 John. In 1 John 3, 6, he says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither knoweth him. This is a repeat. He keeps repeating the same phrase in the same uh, train of thought because this is going to be very important in the tribulation. Your actions are going to drastically affect your destiny. <laughs> so they have to really be reminded of it. And there, I mean, we need it too. But there, just imagine how evil it is right now. And the Antichrist isn't on earth. Imagine when he gets here. It's going to be a hundred times worse. Um, in um, 1 John 3.10 says basically the same thing. We'll move on. Look at uh, verse 12. And I've got one verse out of order. Let me move that. Okay. Verse 12. Demetrius, Demetrius hath good report of all men. I had to read that a couple of times because it's not worded like we would word it. We would say Demetrius hath a good report. <laughs> he says Demetrius hath good report. <laughs> That's just the way it is. <laughs> of all men. And of the truth itself, yea, we also bear record, and you know that our record is true. Okay, so it's important for a person to have a good report. I just came across the, this little thing this week. There are Christians who, th who are sadistic. They think if you're not down on humanity, then you're not spiritual. And the meaner you can get, the more spiritual you are. That's wrong. I saw a post that said, you're not a good person, I'm not a good person, there's no good person. Baloney. This one right here is a good person. He has a good report of all men. You should be a good person. And the world should know it. Now, you're not good as far as qualifying for God's goodness, no. But his goodness is in you, so it should be working out. Yeah. Look at it in Acts 3, or Acts 6, verse 3. Acts 6, verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may, may appoint over this business. Okay, they're going to ordain them some deacons here. They're going to get a replacement. And in so doing, he gives them qualifications. He didn't say... We're all wicked, just pick anybody. No, he's qualifying it. Some people are better than others. Okay, that's a fact. You should be good. Look at Titus chapter 1. Titus 1 verse 7. Titus 1 verse 7. He says, for a bishop must be, and then he's going to go through the qualifications. This is whoever's leading the church. Look at the last qualific or one of the last qualifications, verse eight. A lover of hospitality, a lover of good men. If there's no such thing as good men, why did the Bible say that? You're supposed to love good men. Then there better be some, because <laughs> that's part of the qualifications. So you should be identifying as you go throughout your life who's a good person, and the Bible tells you how to define that. They have God's qualif qualifications. 1 Samuel 18, 1 Samuel 18, verse 1, 1 Samuel 18, verse 1, and it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, 
that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Okay, so you're, there's a deeper connection here than just their acquaintances. And for us, you're going to meet people. And when that happens, when you meet somebody, there's something that goes on beyond the superficial. If you've got the Spirit of God in you, spirits recognize spirits. Mm -hmm. And something should click. You can meet some people and you just know instinctively that they're saved. You can meet some people that talk it, but you instinctively know they ain't. <laughs> That's that spirit. Look at it in 1 Kings 5. 1 Kings 5, verse 1. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants unto Solomon, for he had heard that he had anointed him king in the room of his father. For Hiram was ever a lover of David. Okay, he recognized a good man. David was a good man. Here's a heathen that recognizes it. Well, even the world should recognize the goodness from God in a person. So a person should strive to be a good person. Psalm chapter 16. Psalm 16, verse 2. Here's the right balance on the whole thing. Psalm 16, 2. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord. My goodness extendeth not to thee. That is, me being good doesn't add anything to you. However, it does for this earth. Look at verse 3. But to the saints that are in the earth, and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. He says, my goodness is going to do good for people. I don't do good down here because it's going to benefit God. I'm doing good for the people down here. The body of Christ, no, it's not a body of Christ there, but the body of Christ now needs the help of the body. The way we get it is by doing good, not being wicked. <laughs> Amos. Amos chapter 5. Amos 5 verse 15. Hate the evil. Hate is such a strong word. And when the Bible says it, it means it. <laughs> it doesn't mean... Um, most people will tell you that when the Bible uses the word hate, it means um, in comparison to... No, it actually means hate. Okay, you can't love something good if you don't hate something bad. Hate the evil, love the good, and establish judgment in the gate. Now, what is the evil that he's talking about to hate? And what is the good that he's talking about loving? It's not things. It's people. Look at it. The gate? What happens in the gate? People walk through it. You're to identify the good and the evil as they walk through. Keep on, he says something else. Uh, it may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant, those are people, of Joseph. Okay, so the good and the evil there is talking about his people. And there's some people who are very evil. <laughs> and you should identify them and abstain from hanging with them. First John 3. First John 3, verse 14. First John 3, verse 14. And we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Now, that's a heavy verse right there. <clears throat> that's as close as you get to eternal security in the tribulation. <laughs> I know I've got it because I love my brethren. <laughs> well, uh, that doesn't work too well down here now. Now, I know doctrinally, that is a doctrinal statement that does not apply in the church age and it will apply in the tribulation. The way we can apply it is simply by looking at it, we know. The way I know, my knowledge of spiritual things increases the more I'm with spiritual people and the more I enjoy the company of spiritual people. That will increase your knowledge of spiritual things. 
And if you're saved, your soul really loves that. You can do this. Uh, don't do it, but <laughs> maybe you have experienced this. <laughs> if you've not been in your Bible and you've not been studying, and maybe you've just gotten busy, life's happened. Then when you finally get back to it, something in you comes to life. That soul comes back to life. That's you knowing who you really are right there when you can uh, get that Bible back in you and it just opens up something that was missing. Look at 1 John 5 verse 1. First John 5, 1 John 5 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. He's saying the same thing again. He's saying Christians like Christians. We're supposed to love the brotherhood. The brother. What does he say? Love the brotherhood? Yeah. The brethren are supposed to love the brethren. The world hates them. We don't need the church hating them. <laughs> now, that sounds pretty silly. But it's a fact. There's a whole lot of... You know, I can't agree with a lot of people doctrinally that I can still love. I enjoy, um, I'm thinking of somebody we all know, that I disagree with doctrinally heavily. However, I enjoy sitting down and talking with this person. Just because they got a lot of Bible in them, they, they're seeking God. You know people like that. Now they're just wrong as they can be, that's okay. God will fix that. <laughs> I don't have to hate it. I actually like that. If somebody's seeking, they can be as wrong as they can as long as they're wanting God's truth. Now, there comes a fine line between being wrong and enjoying being wrong. Mm -hmm. Some people are wrong because it's a selfish motive. And so we got to all watch that. Okay, in our passage there in 3 John, it's Demetrius. And he's, uh, he's obviously a dedicated Christian, and he's got some recommendations here. Now, this is something that church membership does. We do something similar. It's called, we don't do a church membership. Huh? You show up, you come. <laughs> the big church has a, recommended, uh, a recommendation. They'll say, do you want to join the church? And you do it by one or two ways, or three ways. They'll either do it by what's called a transfer of letter. I don't know that any church actually transfers a letter anymore. But used to, you would get a letter from your previous church saying this is a church member in good standing. And we've not had any problems with this person. Or they would send the letter and say, look out. <laughs> this is a troublemaker. He... You know, won't get off of this hobby horse. And, okay, that's the letter of recommendation or not so recommendation. <laughs> but that was for church membership. I don't know that it really applies nowadays. Nobody recommends or doesn't recommend. Nobody knows anything to recommend. <laughs> but they were doing it here. Look at, uh, look at uh, where is that? Third John 1, verse 11. He said, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen him. Okay, there's your first recommendation. Okay, so you can write him and say, This person has a history of doing good. Okay, so that's Demetrius. He's got a good recommendation. He's a good person. As humans know it. Now, I'm not saying that good makes you spiritual, but, I mean, good can be fake too. <laughs> What man considers good, God might not. But at least do the part that man considers good. That'll help. <laughs> He's also got a... Um, look at 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3, verse 7. Here, here it is again. He's giving qualifications. He says, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. A good report. Okay, so he didn't leave town owing everybody. He didn't leave town stealing anything. He didn't run off with somebody's wife. You know, that's a, that's a good report. That goes in the report. 
And the early church did this. Imagine it. And it's probably going to head back that way, and probably in some countries already is. Early church was not an accepted program. So don't you think there was a whole bunch of people that were like Paul started out, infiltrating to spy them out. He says in another place, they came in to spy out our liberty. So there were spies in the midst. So a letter of recommendation meant something. It meant we've, you know, we've been working with this guy. He's the real deal. When Paul got saved, nobody would recommend him. And they said, we're scared of that guy. Do you know? <laughs> you know how bad he is? Yeah. Okay. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians 3. Second Corinthians 3, verse 1. This is the problem with having systems. When you put a system in place, God will shake it up. <laughs> and the system had been, you write these letters of recommendation. Well, now all of a sudden, Paul comes to town. He's a missionary and an itinerant preacher. And he comes into town and the church says, Hey, where's your letter of recommendation? Paul's like, are you stupid? You know who I am? <laughs> Look at it. First Corinthians th or 2 Corinthians 3 verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? <laughs> he said, look, that's a helpful system, but it's not the law. Okay. So these letters of recommendation, that's great if it's helpful, but it's not a necessity. Now there's coming a day where it's going to be. Probably if you were in a communist country, It'd be a very good idea to get a letter of recommendation before you allow somebody in, in the group. There's a lot of spies. And that whole passage covers that again. Third John, verse 12. Third John, verse 12. This, this phrase always tickles me. He says, Demetrius hath good report of all men, and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record. And you know that our record is true. He didn't ask them. He told them. <laughs> you know my record's true. <laughs> He's saying if I wrote a recommendation, it's a good one and you know you can count on it. Wow. <laughs> That's the way he talks. Look at, at the Gospel of John, chapter 21. John 21, verse 24. Here's how he signs his book. I've written you this whole book, and you didn't know who was writing. It's like a letter. At the end of the letter, you sign it so you, they know who wrote it. This is the di disciple which testifieth of these things. So I'm the one that wrote all this and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. He jumps out in the third person there. <laughs> we, meaning me and me, no, I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> Look at it in 1 John 4. It is. <laughs> 1 John 4, verse 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth us not. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Whew! That's heavy news right there. He said, if you can't listen to me, if you can't sit under my teaching, it's because you're not a God. Wow! Now, I would not preach that because I'm not an apostle. <laughs> I, don't, I don't write any inspired scripture, but John could. And he did. Look at it in verse, uh, chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 7. First John 5, verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth. The Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And this, these three agree in one. 
If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which, it, which uh, he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. Here he's explaining that there's a record in heaven, there's a, a record keeper. And he records just like these letters of recommendation. And that thing is supposed to dwell in you. So in another place he says to try the spirits. There, there's, a, there's a recommendation you should get from your spirit when you meet another Christian. That spirit that comes off of them. He says in Job, whose, uh, whose spirit proceeded from thee? That is when you speak, a spirit um, makes itself manifest. And just by being with the wrong crowd, you pick up wrong spirits. Now, that's just a simple fact. I, it's not taught much in churches, and I don't know why. But the, if you want to hang out with the wrong crowd, the fact of the matter is you've got a bad spirit to begin with, and you want more of it. Oof, that's heavy duty. Let's get off that. Third John. Third John, verse 13. John John sat down to write this letter. He's sitting here writing, and it's like when you do a text. You start texting, you know, after you tear your phone up, you start texting somebody and you say, ah, delete, delete, delete. And I start texting, and ah, that doesn't sound right. They don't know what I'm talking I'm going to call them. <laughs> That's what he's doing here. Look at it. Verse 13. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and paper write unto you. But I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee, our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. Okay. He's saying, I got more that I want to say, but it's just not going to fit in this, this little... Like he just wrote us a tiny little letter to begin with. But he said, oh, there's a whole lot more I need to talk to you about. But we better do it face to face. Some things need to be done face to face. Some things do not need to be written. Look at Facebook. <laughs> Most of it should not be written. Yeah. It should be done face to face. Writing out some of that junk <laughs> gets you in trouble and won't fix the problem. Whereas a face to face could. Uh, many times it will. The other thing he says in there is um, about the friends. Now, we would recognize that as Christians. That's obviously talking about the believers. He's saying this crowd of approved people is greeting you. And I'm sending this letter to a church of people that have been recommended and have a good report. And those are our friends. Look at John, the Gospel of John chapter 15. John 15 verse 13. He says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, the military does this. They go out and they die and on the battlefields and things, but they're not doing it for their friends. They're doing it for a paycheck. They're doing it for free tuition. They have other motives. They're not dying because I'm their buddy. They have other motives behind it. I know somebody who died for me directly. Look at it in verse 14. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Wow. Then like John was hardcore. Now John has a lot of lovely things to say. He likes to use the word love. But he doesn't shy away from getting the conviction out. <laughs> He says right here about Jesus Christ. Jesus told him, if you're going to be my friend, you got to qualify. You don't just get saved and become my friend. The friends of Christ are the ones who are obeying him. We've got a lot of hostile Christians. Hostile to the gospel. Hostile to the commands. Verse 15. Henceforth I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his, master, what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. 
Well, we know we've got it. It's all in a book. We've got all of it right here. It's made known to us. And a lot of people... Now, you should consider yourself a servant. You should serve God. However, that relationship should grow into a friendship. Now, it's a friendship where you understand the hierarchy. It's not a friendship where y'all are equals. <laughs> you, you could be friends with somebody important and still be subservient to them. That's the relationship going on right here. But some people never move beyond the servanthood. They've never learned the deeper uh, relationship of Jesus Christ meeting needs and revealing um, what he wants for you. God guides every single day. If you'll be aware of it, that's what a friend gets. The one who's just a servant and has never proceeded on to friendship only knows, well, the commandments say, a good example of it is this, a Catholic. Catholics know the commands. They know the Hail Marys. <laughs> they know what the church has told them. They're trying to obey commandments and letters of the law, but they don't have a guide to help them. That's what the friend does friend comes along and says, hey, you slip in there. Let me help you get this. Or it says, hey, I know it didn't say this, but in your case, obeying that command would be to do this. Like Jesus came up and he said, you've heard it said in the law, thou shalt not this and this, but I'm going to tell you something more. You better be doing this too. Okay, that's the friend. Uh, look at Paul used this in Acts 19. Acts 19, verse 31. Acts 19, 31. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, <laughs> sent unto him, desiring him, that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Don't go to the movie. No, that's not what he's talking about. <laughs> Don't proceed on his journey is what they're telling him. Now, those were his friends. Okay. Whatever local body you're in, church body, those should be your friends. I, you would think that's a normal thing, but not necessarily. The bigger the church, the less the friends are. <laughs> Seems like. Look at Acts 27. <clears throat> Acts 27, verse 3. And the next day we touched at Sidon. And Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. So there were some Christians in the region, and uh, even though he's a prisoner, the guard says, hey, I'm going to give you some liberty. I'm going to give you a chance to go visit the other Christians. And I'm sure that was very helpful to him. You know, he needed a little refreshing. These friends are not just friends of each other because humans can be friends of each other, and the world has friends. Christians have something different. We have a family. <laughs> if you're a friend of God first, then you can be a friend of someone else who's a friend of God. Uh, look at James chapter 2. James 2 verse 23. This is a great, um, a great accolade for Abraham here. James 2, 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Could you imagine that? In the Old Testament, you know, the heavy hand, you were that man's friend. Woo. Not God was his friend. He was the friend of God. Good stuff. Look at uh, ver chapter 4, James 4, verse 4. James 4, verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Okay, so there's different kinds of friendship. He didn't say to be a friend of the world makes you the enemy of God, although he'll go on and say that in a minute, but he says the friendship of the world, them wanting to be your friend. 
The only kind of friendship they know is to be at odds with God. They can't be friends with godliness because they're not of that spirit. The friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world, that's you trying to befriend them, is the enemy of God. Whew. Heavy point to end on, but that's all I got. That's the end of that book. We'll pick up one more small little book uh, next week, Jude, and that one will probably last us a few weeks. Jude is packed full of information. He delves into some heavy duty stuff, and then we'll uh, do a brief brief thing on Revelation, I think, because we've covered most of Revelation. All right, that'll do it for tonight.